Have you seen these portable nesting chairs before? The concept has been around quite a while. What's cool about it is that the seat slides into the back for storage and easy transport. I made these chairs using plans and templates from Jay Bates, one of the OGs in the woodworking space on YouTube. I made some modifications to Jay's design by adding arms that fold up and a handhold between the top two slats. And these chairs aren't made out of pine construction lumber or cedar fence pickets. Not that there's anything wrong with that. This is exotic hardwood, which is way too fancy for camping chairs. We'll have to call them glamping chairs. Want to see how I made them? Welcome back to the wood shop. I'm Brett. To do this project, you'll need a table saw, a jigsaw or a bandsaw, a drill or drill press, a router with a flush trim bit and or a pattern routing bit, and a quarter inch roundover bit. It's helpful to have a miter saw, but you can do the cross cuts on the table saw or even with a circular saw. And depending on the type of lumber you're working with, a thickness planer is also quite useful. And something to drive screws with. I began by pulling out the boards that have been patiently waiting for me to get around to this project. I'm using ash for the slats and African mahogany for the legs. And for the star of the show, this is what $100 of Purple Heart looks like. All material is four quarter or about one inch thick for those of you who don't speak wood talk. This wood is too expensive to waste, so I'm making sure to get the most out of it by laying out the pieces before milling everything down. I made another video where I showed how I made these templates from Jay's free plans, if you're interested. I left a link in the description to both the plans and that video. Oh hey, by the way, I'm on Instagram now. Check me out there for more behind the scenes stuff and what I'm up to on the daily, if Instagram's your thing. When I first started laying out the pieces on the purple heart, I was kind of bummed to discover I didn't have four pieces big enough to fit all four legs. I brought home all the shorts that my local hardwood dealer had in stock, and that one at the bottom of the screen is only about four inches, and that's just not wide enough to fit these curved legs. You need a minimum of five and a half inches. So I thought I was going to have to edge glue two boards to be able to fit two legs. But I just want to double check and see if these will actually fit on the widest board I do have. And it looks like it might. It's gonna be a tight fit, but I think I can do it. This cut's gonna be a challenge though. As in every project, I learned some things along the way and I was able to improve my process as I went along. Next, I bust out my thickness planer to flatten out this rough lumber. I don't always like using this thing because the way I have it mounted, I can't fit the dust collection trout on because it only fits one way. So I end up making a huge mess, as you can see. That being said, if you're trying to decide between a jointer or a planer for your next tool, I'd recommend a planer. There are other ways to joint a board with other tools in your shop, but there's no better way to make two faces parallel to each other and achieve a consistent thickness than a thickness planer. Random thought. Since we're making the wood thinner, shouldn't it be called a thinness planer? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. On this first day, I wasn't trying to achieve a certain thickness. I only wanted to get both sides flat and then let the boards rest for a day or so with stickers between them to let them come back to equilibrium from a moisture standpoint. Here's a quick look at how I stowed the mahogany in what my family calls the dungeon. Then it's the same process with the purple heart. This one piece had a pretty serious check in it that I filled with some medium thick CA glue. Hopefully that'll keep it from getting any worse. After a day of planing, my small shop had a purple haze everywhere. The next day, after more planing, I was able to start cutting out the legs on the bandsaw. Not trying to get too close to the line at this point, but just about an eighth of an inch or so. Except for this piece, which I told you was going to be tricky. It was really only room for the blade to separate the two pieces. I even ran out of room to maneuver with an eighth inch blade, so I had to resort to drilling out some relief holes so I could make the turn without cutting through the line. For the slot for the captured slat, I used an 11 16 Forstner bit to hog out the material before taking it to the router table. Did I mention that there are plans and templates for a child size version of these as well? This half inch spiral down cut flush trim bit has a half inch shank and a one and a quarter inch cutting depth, which worked out really well for this project. I'll leave a link to this bit in the description. It's not an affiliate link. I don't have an affiliation with Bits and Bits. I just think it's a really good bit. 
And bits and bits, if you're watching, I wouldn't mind if you reached out. Notice here that when coming up out of this groove, there is a potential for the spinning bit to catch the edge of these tabs and cause tear out. So I started each tab by coming straight at it about a quarter of the way in and then continuing as you normally would by running the workpiece against the rotation of the bit. But then I came back and did a short climb cut on that leading edge. I hope that makes sense. Look at that flaming curl. This wood is too pretty to be making nesting chairs from. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Now let's talk about these arms. I made this first chair from Western Red Cedar about five months ago. My wife and my daughter said it might be nice if it had arms, so I tested it out, but they ended up a little short. So this go around, I'm making them a bit longer, and I'm just using the ones I already made as a template for the new ones. Okay, now this next part is a little cringy. Most YouTubers wouldn't show you their mistakes like this, but I thought it was important to leave in so you could see what not to do in case you're new to template routing. I think what happened here is that I was going against the grain, petting the cat backwards, so to speak, and that caused some pretty nasty tear out. But instead of repositioning the template and coming at it from the other side, I stubbornly pushed on through and the cat didn't like it. This purple heart also has much longer fibers than the African mahogany, which made it kind of splintery. Okay, enough embarrassment. I actually made these arms first before the legs, and I'm glad I did because it made me a lot more careful when routing the legs, and I paid closer attention to grain direction. I mentioned process improvement a bit ago, and this is one area I was talking about. I started making relief cuts in order to make it easier for the bandsaw to make the bend around these tight curves. I'm making sure to take care not to cut into my templates, but I'm also trying to get as close as possible so the router bit can make a cleaner cut with less chance of tear out. Now it's on to the slats. These are pretty straightforward. They're all 19 and a half inches long by two inches wide by three quarters of an inch thick. For the legs, the thickness isn't as important, but for the slats, three quarters is what we're shooting for. And I snuck up on that thickness by testing the fit inside the slot for the captured slat. Say that 10 times fast. There's a lot of repetition in this project, especially when making parts for multiple chairs. In my case, 45 slats for three chairs. 15 slats per chair. When things start getting monotonous, there is an increased chance for complacency, which can be dangerous. So when you're doing operations like this, make sure you're staying in the moment and absolutely focused on what you're doing. You don't want a momentary lapse in attention to land you in the emergency room. All the pieces get a quarter inch round over, except in the grooves for the slats. Those stay flat. In my first attempt at adding arms to this cedar chair, I placed the pivot slash mounting hole just above the bottommost back slat. That way the back slat functions as a hard stop for the swing of the arm in both directions. You'll see what I mean in a bit. And the placement of the hole was pretty good, so I copied that to the purple heart using a 3 8 inch brad point bit, which is the size of the carriage bolts used to mount the arm. Then I took it over to the drill press so I could get a perfectly perpendicular pilot hole in the purple heart. And then I clamped the two back legs together to transfer that pilot hole to the other leg. Next, I set the depth of the hole to countersink the washer and lock nut in a scrap of MDF. I made sure the diameter of my hole was not only big enough to fit the washer, but also would accommodate a socket wrench. Otherwise, this lock nut would be pretty difficult to tighten. 
Then I came at it from the other side with the same 3 8 inch bit to finish the hole. For the handhold, I clamped the top two slats together and drilled through both of them with a one and a quarter inch Forstner bit and then connected the dots with the bandsaw. Assembly is incredibly easy because the templates for the sides gives you the exact placement for all the parts. We'll start with the back support. Clamping the lowest slat in place, making sure to leave a quarter of an inch overhang on both sides. Then the second to last slat on the top can be installed by drilling pilot holes to prevent splitting and securing with a single screw per slat. You can drill these pilot holes with the slats in place on the legs, however since I'm going to be plugging these screw holes, I wanted them all to be at a consistent depth. So I drilled my slats on the drill press first and then I need to come back and drill the legs to prevent splitting. As with many exotic woods, Purple Heart is more oily than most of our domestic hardwoods. That's what gives it that rich purple color. And that oil can interfere with glue adhesion. So it's a good idea to clean away the oil from any gluing surface with acetone. I'm adding just a bit of glue before screwing. You don't want to go crazy on the glue here because squeeze out will be a pain with all these joints. And any glue that doesn't get cleaned up really well will show up in an ugly way when it comes time to apply finish. And normally we'd have a quarter inch overhang on these back slats as well, but since I'm adding arms, that overhang would be in the way. So these slats are a half inch shorter, so they'll sit flush to the outside of the leg. With only the first slat clamped and the second slat secured with glue and screws, the assembly becomes rigid and you can quickly move through the rest of them. To find the location of the mounting hole, I clamped the arm in place and drilled from the back through the leg hole. Then I marked out the square part of the carriage bolt so I could chisel out a recess for it. I don't want to take any chances of splitting my arms when tightening these down. Then with the assembled back upside down on the table, the seat section is assembled in its nested state. The seat supports slide into the back and are clamped to the back sides with a couple spacers. In my case, I used four finish nails, which will result in about an eighth of an inch wiggle room between the seat and the back when nesting the chair. Make sure the seat sides are clamped parallel to the back sides and an even distance from the ends. And make sure the clamps are not so tight that they bow the side pieces or cause your spacers to make an impression in the legs just enough to keep things in place. Then the seat slats are installed in the exact same way. Make sure there's that same quarter of an inch overhang on each side of the back assembly. Again, I'm pre-drilling these slats on the drill press now that I know their placement. And then follow that up by drilling pilot holes into the seat legs and secure with glue and screws. Finally, the last slat is added to both the seat and the back assemblies and the outermost screw in this case needs to be installed at an angle to prevent splitting the ends of the legs. The very last slat is the captured slat in the seat assembly slot. And the whole point of this is to add a little bit of rigidity to the ground side of the seat assembly. Plus, it's a convenient place to include my branding logo. And this slot is sized for a maximum thickness of 3 quarters of an inch and flush with the sides. It's secured with screws in just the same way, screwing up through the bottom. This is my first time using a plug cutter. It was strangely satisfying to see these plugs plopping out on the bandsaw. After a final sanding to 180 grit, it was time to add some finish. Wiping on this spar urethane was a mistake. A sprayer would have been a much better choice, but I don't own a sprayer. A bristle brush would have been a better choice than wiping it on, which ended up making a lot of extra work for me when I was sanding between coats. And then I brushed on a second coat, being careful not to get any drips or runs. As a reward for the people who watched this video all the way through, 
I'm going to send a free gift to the third person who follows me on Instagram and sends me a DM with the correct number of different shirts I wore in this video. If you want to build these chairs, you can find the links to the plans and templates in the description below this video, as well as all the tools I used in this build. Until next time my friend, be safe and love each other.